thank you guys all for coming. I'm super excited. Carla is a good friend, and um, she's in my head a lot, which is probably a little dangerous. Uh, but um, she was here last year. She had her first book. This is her second book. I haven't read it yet. I know it's going to be amazing. Um, one of my experiences that I can share, my daughter just turned two, and on her second birthday, literally, she woke up from her nap and screamed for 15 minutes. I timed it. <laughs> um, no reason, she woke up crying, she, whatever was going on. The first thing that popped into my head was Carla's voice from the first book telling me that I need to react in a way that's gonna help her. And it was a total mindfulness thing where I just sat there and held her and was calm and as peaceful as possible and waited for it to all pass. And we keep doing that as she wakes up from naps screaming. But the thing that I find is that she walks away from that in a much calmer state than had I gotten super upset, super worried, reacted with her reaction. So that's Carla in my head. Um, she has this awesome new book. It's called Ready, Set, Breathe. And it's practicing mindfulness with your children for fewer meltdowns and more peaceful family. And I am so excited to read it. So without further ado, Carla. Am I turned on? Fabulous. Thank you all so much for coming today. This is, as Tosh mentioned, my second time speaking here at Google. And I had a fabulous time last year, so I'm thrilled to be back. And I want to say thank you especially to Tosh Ross, who helped set this all up. And she's been super supportive and great. Um, so what we're going to do today is I'm going to do some reading from the book so you can get a sense of what the book is like. I'm going to do a little bit of talking about the book about mindfulness with our kids, and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. So I hope that sounds good. All right, we're gonna dive right in at the very beginning, in the introduction. Will you please just calm down and take a breath? I snapped at my five-year-old daughter the other morning. We had both gotten up on the wrong side of the bed, and things had gone downhill from there. She was circling me in the kitchen, whining and crying because we had run out of her favorite cereal, and I had denied her request to take a tiny and very beloved toy to preschool. Her four-year-old sister, who was supposed to be sitting at the table eating her breakfast, kept getting down to grab a toy or finish a drawing she was working on, and I had to keep reminding her to get back in her seat and finish eating. Meanwhile, I was stressed about everything I needed to do that morning. Make lunches, get dressed, finish packing my work bags, and hustle everyone out the door on time. In the back of my mind, I was feeling guilty about leaving that afternoon for a three-day work trip. Even though I knew the girls would be fine at home with their dad, who is sitting right over there. Hi, Josh. Um, I also knew that my impending absence was part of why my daughter was having such a hard morning, and I couldn't help but feel bad about it. Not unlike my little girl, I was tired and overwhelmed, and barking at her to breathe was the closest I could get to my mindfulness practice in that moment, which is to say not very close at all. Not surprisingly, she responded in kind. I don't want to breathe, mommy. The ridiculousness of her statement may have been lost on her, but it snapped me out of my own irritability just long enough to give me a little perspective. I put down the peanut butter knife, put my hands flat on the counter, and took a few deep breaths. When I felt myself calm down a little bit, I picked up my daughter, sat her down on my lap, and kept breathing. Eventually, her heaving chest calmed down, and her breathing became more slow and steady. After a few minutes, she asked me what I was doing. I'm just breathing, that's all. Oh, she replied with a smile, me too. And so we sat for a few minutes and just breathed together. While I know that she actually was breathing, I don't know if she was aware of her breath in the same way I was. I had been purposely paying attention to the air moving in and out of my nose, and each time a stressful thought entered my mind about everything I had to get done or how I was gonna get her sister to eat her breakfast, I let the thought go and came back to my breath. For all I know, my daughter could have been thinking about baby dolls or unicorns or ice cream sandwiches, anything but her breathing. The truth is, it doesn't really matter. By the time I went back into the kitchen, we were both feeling a lot calmer, more connected, and present with each other and ourselves. It's not that anything had really changed. My daughter still wasn't getting her favorite breakfast or bringing her toy to school, and I still had a million things to do. The difference was that once we had calmed down, rather than freaking out in our own minds or subsequently all over each other, we were both able to deal with these challenges a little more effectively. The moment that set our morning on a better path was the moment when I put down the knife, oh yeah, put down the knife, mindful parenting pro tip, put down the knife, <laughs> and took a few deep breaths. When I did that, I was intentionally trying to get myself into a more mindful mindset. 
which is simply about paying attention to whatever is happening right here and right now without judging it or wishing it was different. I had spent most of the morning doing one thing with my body, showering, getting dressed, or making breakfast, and another thing with my mind, generally stressing, worrying, and feeling guilty. This split attention characterizes the way most of us move through our daily lives most of the time, often without even noticing it. Multitasking often feels avoid unavoidable in modern life, and it can at times help us be a bit more efficient. More often than not, however, it leads to increased stress, mistakes, and errors, and snappy responses to our children. When I was in the kitchen making sandwiches, I was so wrapped up in my own unhelpful thoughts that I wasn't really paying attention to what was going on with my daughter, which is how we got caught up in a power struggle over toys and cereal. But after taking the time to notice what was really happening, I was able to respond to it in a much more skillful and effective way by giving my daughter the attention she had been asking for all along. The deep breaths I took were an important step in helping me get out of my own head and back into the present, and that's what mindful parenting is all about making a choice to focus our attention on the present moment with kindness and curiosity so we can make a thoughtful choice about how to proceed rather than reacting out of frustration. So I chose this passage from the book for a few reasons. Um, number one, as you noticed, that moment of mindfulness with my daughter started with me, right? I was in a pretty not helpful headspace and I kind of had to turn it around so that I could then be present with my daughter and in the process I was teaching her something. The second important point from that is that mindful parents are not mindful all the time. There is this assumption when somebody says, I practice mindful parenting, especially if they say it in an obnoxious voice like that, that it sounds like you assume they sort of walk through their parenting life blissed out and zenned out and totally present and calm no matter what happens. And I don't know, I've never met anyone like that and I'm certainly not like that. And, um, what mindful parenting means or practicing mindfulness means is that we have a set of school skills and tools and a specific insight about our own experience that we can use when we get off track. And I get off track many times a day. And all it means is that when I can finally notice that my mind is a million miles away, that I'm not paying attention, that I'm wrapped up in my own thoughts and worries, I now have this understanding that I don't have to take the bait of my own brain as it were. I can make a choice to come back to the present moment. And often that means just taking a few breaths until I can figure out what I actually need to focus on. Uh, the next reason I read that passage is because when we are teaching mindfulness to our kids, it works best if we do it with them, especially initially, but in an ongoing way. And I think we all have this little fantasy that we can kind of hand our kid a snow globe or a glitter wand and say, here, go look at this and breathe and come back when you're calm. And yes, I wish that too, but it just doesn't work that way most of the time. We need to sit with our kid and do the practice with them and we're both gonna benefit. And eventually they'll you know, integrate it and be able to do it on their own. And the last uh, reason I read that is it's really important to be transparent with our kids about what we're doing. And so in that moment, my daughter said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm breathing. And I specifically said that to her because I wanted her to know exactly what I was doing. I didn't say, I'm trying to calm down because that doesn't help her. Like that doesn't tell her, give her any information about what we do to try to calm down. So I was very concrete, I'm breathing. And being transparent about our own mindfulness practice is actually harder than it sounds because it's such an internal experience. It's all about our minds and how we're perceiving the world and what we're choosing to focus on. And finding a way to say to your kids, I'm having a really hard time. I'm about to lose it all over you. I'm gonna go in the other room and breathe. It's weird. It's a weird thing to do because you have to have the presence of mind to notice what's going on. You have to be able to remember to tell it to your kids. And then you have to actually go do it, which is the hard part, because we say all these things we're going to do, and then we don't do them. So that's the tricky part. Uh, but I found that you know, for a long time, when I was about to lose it, or when I had just lost it, when I'd yelled at my kids, I would go in the kitchen and put my hands on the counter and start breathing. And then I'd come back, and I'd be a little calmer. And my daughters had no idea what I was doing in there. For all they knew, I was sticking my head in the refrigerator. So I had to make a point of starting to say to them, I'm going in the kitchen to breathe so I can calm down. And now they'll say, oh, mommy must be upset. She's going, she's breathing. Mommy's breathing. <laughs> yes, I'm breathing. So those are some important points. Um, now modeling and transparency are just two of the ways we can teach mindfulness to our children. And I would argue they're two of the most important ways. Um, but some other ways are sharing an activity with your kids, such as reading a children's book. There are some really great ones out there. Um, my favorite current picture book, which is probably good up through second or third grade, is called Charlotte and the Quiet Place by Debbie Sosin. And it's a lovely story about this little girl named Charlotte who can't, she lives in a busy city, she can't find any quiet, and she goes out for a walk with her dog, the dog runs away, 
she chases him and then they're both kind of panting because they've been running and in that she finds her breath and finds a quiet place. Um, but you can read a children's book to your kids. There are some great apps for kids. Um, just to be clear, screen time is not mindfulness practice, right? Because even though our kids look like they're being calm and focusing, they're spacing out. It's not mindfulness. So that's not to say screen time is bad. It's just to say don't think your kids are med meditating in front of Caillou because they're not. Um, and then you can also teach your kids specific skills and tools, like breathing activities, noticing activities, and I'm going to talk about some of those today. But before we go on, I want to take a minute to define mindfulness, because this is a word that's all over the place these days, and I think many of us have misconceptions about what it is and what it isn't. So the traditional sort of Western definition of mindfulness, which was first put forth by John Kabat-Zinn, who uh, worked out at UMass Worcester for a long time, and he started mindfulness-based stress reduction. Uh, his traditional definition is paying attention to the present moment um, in a non-judgmental way. Now, I don't know about you, but those are pretty big words for kids. And I personally don't like it when somebody tells me to pay attention. I don't think my kids respond particularly well. And furthermore, how many times, how many of you have ever had someone tell you or define for you or tell you how to pay attention? Anybody? I don't, like, okay, so what did you hear? What, what did somebody tell you? Okay, so for everybody out there, what he said was uh, he was told to focus on what they were saying and listen the way uh, they wanted him to listen, and it didn't feel very helpful. I agree. That doesn't sound very fun. So the, the definition I like for kids, um, which I also borrowed components from Amy Saltzman, who's a physician out in the Bay Area who also teaches mindfulness, is noticing the present moment with kindness and curiosity so we can choose our next behavior. That choosing the next behavior, that's like the pot of gold at the, parent, at the end of the parenting rainbow, right? We all want kids who can take a moment and say, I'm actually going to choose to use my words instead of dropping to the floor and screaming like a crazy person. So that's what we're going for with our kids and with ourselves, is this sense that we have some choice in what we're going to do instead of just reacting. So let's, let's break down this definition a little bit. So the first part is noticing. Kids know how to notice, right? My daughter can notice a baby doll from like a mile away. She's got an insane radar for it. Um, Little boys often can notice trucks and tractors. And I, I know gender split, blah, 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 but what I've seen, this is like how it seems to break down. So noticing is super important because so much happens in our life that we just don't even see it. I mean, we can walk through our, I mean, I've driven the same way to school every day and I had no idea that the giant Santa was up on the corner until my daughters were like, look, there's Santa there. And I think he'd been there for a week. This thing is like 10 feet tall. It's enormous. I was so wrapped up in my own mind, I missed it. Right, so so much of our life happens without noticing it. And if we aren't noticing, if we aren't paying attention to use that phrase, it'll go right past us. And so how do we notice things? Well, we can notice them with our eyes. We can notice them with our ears, with our, I mean, all of our senses, when we touch something, when we taste it, when we smell it. But the art of noticing is about, or paying attention, is about choosing to bring our attention, whatever part of our body we're doing that with, and focus it on something, right, to like, notice it to pay attention to it and then when our mind wanders we bring it back and that's the part that I think we lose in this definition is that everybody assumes that when you're paying attention you are paying 100% attention and your mind never strays well I don't know how many of your minds can do that but mine certainly can't and so the trick to noticing and paying attention is to be okay when your mind wanders and then say oh my mind just wandered I'm gonna bring it back to what we're talking about so that's the first part the next part is the present moment now, the vast majority of us spend the vast majority of our time in the past or in the future. We're worried about something that may or may not happen. We're planning for events. We're sort of fantasizing about how a conversation may go. Or we're in the past kind of regretting, wishing things had been different, or feeling nostalgic for something that's already gone. Um, this is a very useful skill to have, in fact. You know, the caveman, whenever, millions of years ago, who could remember that when Uncle Joe went into that cave and got eaten by a saber-toothed tiger and can plan in the future to not get eaten by that saber-toothed tiger is the one who's more likely to have kids and, you know, pass along his genes. So this brain that can do this is a very useful thing. And you know, now as parents, when we can remember the anaphylactic shock that our kid had when she ate a peanut and make a plan to send a peanut-free cupcake to the birthday party, not only are we avoiding an allergic reaction, but potentially a major meltdown. So this is a good thing. The problem is our brains don't know when to turn it off, right? We're constantly doing it. And there's a couple of problems with this. One is we can't get accurate data on what's actually happening 
if we're not paying attention to what's actually happening. If we're too busy filtering the world around us through a lens of what's going to happen next or, oh gosh, this is reminding me of this thing that happened all this years ago and now I'm sort of thinking about that and I'm not really seeing. And parenting, man, that gets us going, right? Because no matter what's going on with our kids, we're always sort of balancing it between what's going to happen next and what already happened. So my daughter, when she was having a hard time learning to ride a bike, I was automatically like, she's going to be 40 and she can't ride a bike. And her husband's going to want to like take her on this bike trip to France. And she's not going to be able to go. And all their friends are going to go. And it's going to be like this awkward thing. And it's going to cause the marital tension. What? That's insane. But that's where my brain went. And then, of course, I was worried about the past. Like, oh, man, last summer we didn't work on the bike riding. And it's my fault. If I had worked on the bike riding last summer, we would totally be all over this. And she'd be with all these other kids riding their bike like a little gang of Hello Kitty sparkled gangsters or something. Um, but what I needed was to be with their right, be with her right there in that moment, holding the handlebar and walking with her. That's where we can make a difference, right? The present is where the action is. So it's where we can get the best information on what's actually happening, and it's where we can actually take action. That's why the present moment is so important. Um, let's talk about this kindness and curiosity bit. This is also the non-judgmental thing. So for most of us, when we actually come to the present moment, we immediately judge it. Sometimes we judge it as pretty good, and then we whip out our phones and want to take a picture of it, which immediately takes us out of the present moment, because then you're like, ooh, I got a Facebook message. I better check that one. And all of a sudden, you're like, you know, buried with some other person a million miles away on Facebook. Um, or we judge it as kind of boring, and we don't like boring. Human beings are terrible at boring, so we really want that to be different. Or it's great, and then we're like, oh, it's going to end. This is awful. Or it's terrible, and then we, all we can think about is how soon we can get out of it. Most of us, most of the time, are not walking around going, huh, things are pretty OK right now. I'm all right with this. Or most of the time, we're not curious. Like, what's going on? So if we're in a, like a terrible traffic situation, it's like, oh, this is miserable. I'm never going to get to work on time, as opposed to, huh, why is all this traffic here? Which sounds like a really ridiculous question, but it gets you out of this crazy mind. So when we can be in the present moment with this kind, curious stance. Not only is it sort of a much more pleasant way to be, but we're more likely to take more effective action. So there's this whole field of study now called self-compassion. How many of you like have that word come into your lives on a daily basis, even a regular basis? Well, my husband, but yeah, OK. Um, so what researchers have found is that when you take a compassionate response to anything that's happening in your life, especially difficult things, you are much more likely to take the next, your next action is much more likely to be more effective. So let me give you an example that um, most women, many men can relate to. You decide you're going to go on a diet. And two days later, you find yourself eating an Oreo. Now, what do most people think after they eat the Oreo? I suck. I'm miserable at this. Everybody else can diet, and I can't. This is so hard. It's never going to happen. Forget it. And then what happens? You eat the whole sleeve. It's gone, right? The Oreos are gone. But if your response is, huh, that was interesting. Why did I do that? Dieting's really hard. Everyone struggles with it. It's OK. I made a mistake. You are much more likely to put those Oreos away. And this is true for almost every behavior change. So sometimes when we talk about self-compassion, it can sound a little touchy-feely. It's actually an incredibly effective way to approach our own experience and our kids' experience. And then the last one is sort of choosing our next behavior, right? So we've got noticing the present moment with kindness and curiosity so we can choose our next behavior. This whole noticing the present moment, kindness and curiosity bit, that's all about creating enough space in our awareness so we can figure out what's actually going on and then make the best and most skillful choice about what to do next. Because most of the time, it's like something happens, we get this input, and then we immediately react. Boom. And that reaction, it could be from a place of worry. It could be from a place of anxiety. It could be from a place of remembering something that happened two weeks or 20 years ago, and we don't even know that we're remembering it, right? Our brains work that amazingly that all of a sudden we're triggered. Our kid spills the milk, the Cheerios, right? And we're flipping out at our kid, not because we actually care about the spilled milk or Cheerios, but because when we were kids, we got yelled at for spilling milk and Cheerios, and it triggers that automatic reaction. So we can, we can slow down and say, huh, that's interesting. Sounds really cheesy when I say it, but when you do it enough times in your brain, you get used to it. Then we can say, OK, my kids spilled the milk and Cheerios. What is the most effective way to respond to this? And then you figure it out. So does that all make sense right now? 
All right, so if we start with this mindfulness definition, let's take a minute to talk about why do we actually want this for our kids and ourselves? Like why, we, we parents have enough on our plate to figure out, right? Why interject this new practice, this new idea? Well, there has been a shocking amount of research on this with kids, um, primarily in schools and clinics where they're teaching it to children. Uh, and what they found is everything we want for our child, right? Growing awareness of our body, of their bodies, their thoughts, and their emotions, and an increased ability to verbalize it. And how great would it be if every time our kids were having a hard time, they came to us and said, gee, mom, I'm having a hard time today. I think my stomach hurts. Can you please help me find a solution to this? As opposed to like melting down and flipping out in the car on the way to school, right? So kids do that. Um, increased resilience and ability to soothe themselves, to calm down, and to regulate their emotions. This is something most of us grown-ups are still working on. If we can start to help our kids do it, that's amazing. Increased empathy, a stronger sense of other people's emotions, improved con concentration and ability to focus, better sleep, that's a good one, right? Um, increased confidence, decreased anxiety, like all of these things, and it sounds like this panacea, like this magic potion, and it's not. But if you think of all of these things, so many of them happen. So many of the challenges we face, not being able to concentrate, not, uh, struggling with big feelings, not knowing how to manage them, not sleeping well at night, so many of those come from this awareness and this attention that's all over the place. It's like that pinball machine you guys have right here. Uh, the, the thoughts are like constantly bouncing around, and that makes it hard to do the things we want and need to do in life. So. The good news is that our children are already little Zen masters. Now, there's two ways to think about this. One, the role of a Zen master is to constantly push your buttons so you have lots of opportunities to practice mindfulness. And I'm sure that's the one many of you can relate to, right? Um, but I would argue that children are also capable of great mindfulness, of moments of intense awareness, concentration, and presence. The problem is they always want to do it when we need them to put on their shoes so they can get out the door. Having said that, I would like you to read you a section from the book about sort of encouraging these mindful moments in our kids, how we can sort of recognize and support when our kids are already being mindful inherently. I'm sure you've witnessed your child having a mindful moment. Perhaps it's when he is intent on building the tallest Lego tower ever, or is spinning an elaborate fairy tale about fairies living in the bedside table, elaborate tale, or is focused on hearing every word and note of a favorite song. Maybe it's when he's in the zone on the soccer field about to score a goal. While none of these may seem like particularly mindful moments, they are. When your child is focused on just one thing, when he's fully engaged, not judging himself or wishing something were different, he is practicing mindfulness, even though he's not sitting cross-legged on the floor with his eyes closed. When your child is expressing interest in the world around him by mushing his banana between his fingers to see what it feels like, or by stopping to notice a flower growing through a crack in the pavement, or by asking questions about what happens when we die, why we have to eat vegetables, or the shape of the human body, he's being mindfully curious around, about the world around him. And finally, when your child is being aware of and concerned about someone else's feelings or health or well-being, when he brings a special toy to a crying sibling or makes a card for a friend's birthday or visits a sick friend after school, he's practicing mindful compassion. These moments are important for several reasons. Each time our children are concentrating, being curious or creative, or demonstrating compassion, see what I did there? Concentrating, curious, creative, compassion all the C's, help you remember. They are learning to pay attention and notice what is happening within them and around them. They are learning to make connections, think in new ways, and respond skillfully to difficult, challenging, or boring situations. They are practicing empathy and kindness towards themselves or others. And they are drawing on their own inner experience for inspiration, guidance, and soothing, rather than counting on someone else to do it for them. The more often they do all of these things, the more likely they will be able to do them in the future. Because even the, the seemingly small behaviors are developing and strengthening habits and skills and the neural connections in the relevant parts of their brains. These are just a few of the reasons why it's important to practice mindfulness with our children when they're calm, happy, and doing well. The other reason is that those are the times when they're most likely to be receptive to what we're trying to teach them. The more they practice these skills when they are in a good space, the more likely they'll be able to access and utilize them in difficult moments. As one of my mindfulness teachers once put it, you can't practice crisis meditation. As our children get better at practicing mindfulness in the calm, uneventful moments of daily life, the more likely they'll, you'll be able to access this skill, they'll be able to access this skill when we really want them to, when they're overcome with anger, anxiety, or sadness. 
Actively teaching your children about the ideas and practices of mindfulness is part of the process to be sure and will be covered more in later chapters. However, you'll be most successful in your endeavors if you can notice when your child is already being his own little Zen master and support him in that process, or at the very least not get in the way. So two important points here. One is that we need to find and create those times in our lives when our kids can be mindful and we can stay out of their way. Because so often we're nudging and nagging and let's go and let's go and we gotta do this next thing and you gotta clean up your room and it's time to do your homework and we gotta get ready for dinner, that we don't give them that space. And so I was guilty of that too. This year we had our kids in swimming, guitar, and dance. And they're in kindergarten and first grade. And somehow when I set this all up, it seemed reasonable and now that I say it, it seems totally ridiculous. But what I realized is that they had no free time. And they needed time to just sit and be and play. And I was seeing it in their behavior. They were getting grumpy and irritable. And basically, we'd spend all day Saturday managing tantrums because they were exhausted after the week. So swimming and guitar are out. They're doing dance on Sunday mornings because we need some place to take them in the winter on the weekends. And that's it. And we come home from school, and I'm like, go play. I'm making dinner. And sometimes they need a little help getting into it. But once they're into it, it's their space to kind of be present and creative. Um, and they really need that. Uh, and this is a big challenge for us parents, parenting in this cohort, in this culture, because it's like we have to prepare our kids for everything. They have to be able to play an instrument and speak a language or they will never work at Google. And the thing about that is they also need the emotional skills to deal with boredom and frustration. Because we can send them to every math camp, but if they get frustrated when they get one problem wrong and they give up on the test, it doesn't matter how much they know. And especially at the younger ages, but at all ages, we need to create this space for our kids. Um, the next thing I would say that's super important is the reason that many of us come to mindfulness for ourselves or for our children is to deal with our own personal challenges and our children's challenges. Like, dear God, I want this child to stop melting down in Panera. I can't deal with this. And so then what we do is we bust out our little trick when they're having a hard time. That doesn't work. That's like you trying to teach me to code computer languages when I'm like really sad about something or really angry. It's not gonna happen. Like we can't integrate new information when we're in a bad space emotionally. Especially little ones, but all of us, their brains are just flooded with hormones when they're melting down. They can't even hear the words coming out of your mouth, much less learn something new from that you. So we have to find ways to start integrating this into our daily lives when they're calm and happy and feeling connected. And if we do that often enough, then they'll have it available when they really need it. So. The other day, my five and a half year old was sitting on the couch like this. <laughs> and I was like, Rose, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm very upset, mommy, I'm weaving. And like, this is not the breathing that I think is really gonna help her calm down. But for months now, we've been practicing breathing and doing breathing. And finally, she was like trying to breathe in the middle of a meltdown. And I was like, that is a huge win right there, even though she was actually hyperventilating, but we'll get there. Um, so starting it when your kids are in a good space and working on this. And as you'll notice in the book, it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It's not like we're gonna pull out the meditation cushions and light the incense and bang the you know, singing bowl and sit down and breathe. Like If that's your style, that's fantastic. But if it's like, hey, let's sit down and play Legos and I'm gonna work really hard not to nag you about how to make that tower the most stable tower ever and I'm just gonna let you be. Or if it's like, you know, my daughters and I will sit on the front porch and I'll say, let's just listen for sounds. I'll give you one minute and I want you to report back to me two sounds. And the minute is actually like 25 seconds because that's what they can handle right now. But they, they get quiet and they listen for two sounds. And then I'll say, let's just sit together and breathe for 10 seconds. Can we notice our breathing? My seven-year-old can definitely do 10 seconds. My five-year-old is like four seconds. My brain is like two seconds. So, but you know, practicing these things and finding ways to work them into your daily life. If you have a religious or spiritual practice, you can say your prayers together and recognize that as a mindfulness practice. And many of these, these things, when you read the book, you'll be like, oh, I'm already doing that. We play Jenga. I didn't know that was a mindfulness practice. The trick is deciding it is. So making a point to pay attention and then notice when your attention has wandered and then bring it back. And so all of these things, when we really make a point to insert them into our day um, are going to end up being quite useful. Uh, let's see. So I want to give you a couple of tricks and tips before I leave. Um, my favorite mindfulness trick um, is that you can't be curious and angry at the same time. This is extremely cool. 
and I never noticed it until someone told me recently. But curiosity comes from our prefrontal cortex, which is right up here, and it requires that this part of our brain that can plan and think and process and manage emotions, that this part is online. And anger comes from back here, right? This is like the reptilian fight, flight, freak out, freeze part of our brain that's like, I can't even think. And even though you just offered me a snack and ice cream, I'm still screaming at you because I'm losing my mind. So those can't function at the same time. They just can't. So when this part's turned on, our kids can't think or do anything, but if we can get this part to come online, the back calms down a little bit. So one of the tricks I'll do with my daughter when she's really losing it, and I have to wait until she's calm enough to at least hear my voice, um, is I'll try to get her curious about the world around us. So if we were in this room together and she was losing it, I'd say, hey, can you find a screen in this room? Like make it really easy to start. So I'm not gonna say, can you find somebody who's wearing brown boots? That's too much. And then, can you find me like a chair? And sometimes if she's so lost, like she couldn't find a chair in this room. But make it really easy and see if you can get them curious. Now if, you know, my older daughter will say to me, don't, don't do that trick on me, I don't want that trick, I wanna be angry, and I'm like, okay. Then you let her be angry and your, your job in that moment is to stay calm so she can get through the anger. Um, so that's a nifty trick also in life when you're getting like pissed off. Like when I'm pissed off in traffic, I try to get curious about um, tail lights. Tail lights come in a lot of different shapes and sizes. It's amazing. I had no idea and I'm like, hmm, there's a round one. Hmm. So can you get curious about something? It really helps you calm down. Um, and then I wanna read you a little bit about something called a cool down corner which is a very helpful uh, space to set up for a kid. And I also thought it'd be appropriate for Google because you guys have like a million of them here. And they're shaped like airplanes and jails and really cool, well not jails, that's not the best example. But um, <laughs> So creating a calm down corner. In addition to making a more mindful environment throughout your house, which is something I talk about in the book, you may want to consider creating a special calm down corner. This can be a small room or even a corner of a room, a small comfortable chair or an indoor child's tent. The idea is to create a space that is conducive to a calm, mindful experience and that specifically cues your child to get quiet and focused. It's a good idea to involve your child as much as possible in the design of the space and in choosing what to put in it. You'll want it to be decorated in a way that appeals to him or her, keeps her interested, and helps her get and stay calm. Here are a few ideas to keep in mind. You can choose a calming theme for the space, but you don't have to. I have one friend who named her kid's space the Cool Down Corner and filled it with books about Antarctica, as well as a few stuffed polar bears and penguins. Another friend created a seat in space. She and her son cut out some stars and planets to hang from the sky and included a few a favorite stuffed alien doll and a few different space-themed toys and books. Choose a few toys that your child would like to have or activities she can do completely unsupervised. So like if Play-Doh freaks you out, don't put the Play-Doh in there. Like put stuff that you can leave the kid alone with. You'll want to work with her to choose things that are age or developmentally appropriate. Don't put too much stuff in the calm down corner. Regardless of how cluttered the rest of your house may be, this is an area that should have just a few items. Too much stuff will make it hard for your child to focus and choose what to do. You'll want to include items and toys that are known and comforting to your little one, not items to challenge her to try new or different activities. No need to spend much money, you likely already have or can make anything you want to include. No screens, tablets, or electronic toys in the calm down corner, with the exception of an MP3 or CD player loaded with guided meditations. And you can get them on like eBay really cheap that don't have a screen on them, like the old school iPod ones. This is not a timeout spot and your child should not be forced into it. It may be a spot she chooses instead of timeouts if you use timeouts in your house, but it should always be a place she goes willingly. You want your child to have positive associations with the calm down corner, which won't feel easy if it feels like a jail cell to her. The calm down corner is a sacred space where shouting, nagging, arguing, discussing, questioning, and negotiating are not allowed. This space isn't for figuring things out or rehashing problems. It's just for being, breathing, and doing quiet, soothing activities. That's all. Once you're there, you're safe. And that last pit is the hardest part for me because I want to like go after my kid and be like, wait, we're not done talking about this. Not the time to do that. If you don't have the space in your house to do that, you can also create like a calm down box or a little cloth bag and you can put, um, my kids love Silly Putty is always a good choice and it doesn't, I mean, it can sort of get mashed into a rug, but not as bad as Play-Doh. Um, like they sell little glitter wands that are nice things to look at, a small notepad and some pens. If your kid is into Rubik's Cubes and that's not gonna stress her out, something like that. Anything they can sort of manipulate with their bodies is really useful. Um, or that will, I mean, some kids really like strong scents, so you can find a little scented pillow to put in there. Whatever works for your kid. And you really have to pay attention to your child because 
Um, everybody's got different things that work. And then the last trick I really have is get your kids outside as much as possible. And I know we all hear this, and when somebody tells me that and I'm in a stressed moment, I'm like, I can't even deal. And have you met Boston Winter? Like, don't talk to me. But it makes a huge difference. There's not as much clutter around it. Kids can move their bodies more. All of this helps us get into a more mindful space. And so in the winter, we bundle our kids up and we go outside. And sometimes we spend 10 minutes getting dressed and five minutes outside, and that's OK. But it's much more easy for kids to get in a mindful space when they're outside. So those are some ideas. There's a lot more in the book. And at the risk of sounding like a TV salesperson, there are over 100 activities in this book. And um, I interviewed 30 different parents for this because there are many, many great books on the market about teaching mindfulness to children. And I can recommend some to folks who are interested. Most of them are based on the author's experiences in schools and clinics, which is really useful and important. But anyone who has ever tried to teach their own child anything knows it's really different from how kids learn at school. And there's all sorts of dynamics that happen at home. And we also have lots of opportunities at home that don't happen at school. Um, but I wanted this book to be representative of a lot of different families' experiences, because my family is quirky, and we have our own preferences and a certain way of doing things. So I talked to 30 different parents about how they do this at home. So there's a whole lot of activities and ideas in here. And choose the ones that work for you, and make up your own. And don't worry if some don't work for you. It's not your gig. That's fine. But that's the book. That's the talk. Hopefully we have some time for questions. Oh, here's somebody. You mentioned uh, one uh, picture book to share with kids yeah. uh, in the course of it. I wonder if you had any suggestions for even moving older, the 10 and 11 year old who want, you know, is, is old enough to recognize, wow, I regularly screw things up when I get really stressed out and you know, I say things that uh, I don't want to say. So a little older than picture book, but maybe not ready to just take an adult self-help book off the shelf and you know, I, this is a question I frequently get at talks, and I've been looking for something, and I haven't found anything I love for that age. There is, and again, I don't like pushing screen time for this particular issue, because it's sure. not really what we're going for, but there's a website. I think, I could be wrong, I think it's called gozen.com. Okay. But if you look up, like, Zen Anxiety Kids YouTube, it'll pop up, and whether or not anxiety is the issue, I know that that's one of the things they address, and they have some pretty good animations that are helpful. Great, thank you yeah. very much. Yeah, please. Does it not work for kids under three? Does it not work? Oh yeah. So, so the question was, does it not work for kids under three? No, it definitely works for kids under three. I mean, my publisher was like, pick an age range. I was like, okay. But I mean, the reality is, it's all about figuring out what works for your kids. Like. Under three, you can totally start doing these activities with your kids. The ones that are going to be most effective is the ones you practice, and then it sort of leaks out, for lack of a better term, to your children. So when we can stay calm when our children wake up from the nap screaming, um, that's a great one. When we can let our you know, toddlers and little ones have the space and the time to just play and explore the environment, and we're not like getting in their space. And I never thought this would be a thing I did until I had kids. But then I'm like, oh, you're playing. Let's make your play better. Like, let me get in your space and help you make that better. And we, Josh and I stopped doing this when we read a quote by Jack Black, the actor. He said uh, in USA Today, never give a happy child ice cream. And I was like, oh, that's right. I'll save the ice cream for when, you know, maybe they're not so happy. Bribe them with ice cream. No, but um, like just if they're, if they're doing well, leave them alone. And that's surprisingly hard to do and it's especially me I want to get like in it and then Josh will say ice cream and then I can like step away so um, with the little ones and also food is a great time to let them sort of mindfully be curious if you can tolerate it right because then you end up with food all over the place and it's like I just gave you a bath and now you have hummus in your hair but if you can let them really explore food and kind of sit with it and mush it around that's a great practice for little ones too Yes, tips for parents who are freaking out in the moment. So that's what the first book is about. It's called Parenting in the Present Moment. But briefly, yes, when you are freaking out, my tips are see if you can breathe, like pay attention to your breath. And a lot of times people think breathing meditation is this like whole big thing. Like you have to breathe in for four and breathe out for seven and then stand on your head and then like ch chant a mantra. It's not. Just notice your breath, however it is, wherever it is. Some people notice it in their nose. Some people notice it in their chest. Some people notice it in their belly. Just notice. And that'll like calm you down. Um, another one is 
like for some people putting their hands on a countertop, that works for me kind of to get grounded. For some people just sitting down, like feeling your body in contact with something firm can help you feel grounded. Um, and then remembering a few things. One is, unless your child is in danger, you don't have to react right away which it can be such a hard thing when they're screaming. Like, they can scream for a minute. They can tolerate it, especially if they know they're, that you're around and they're safe. And if they ask you something and you don't know what to do, like, you don't have to have an answer, right? You can say, I need some time to think about that. Um, and the other thing is that you can always start a mindfulness practice again and again and again. So there's a saying in the mindfulness world, which is that it's really easy to be mindful. It's really hard to remember to be mindful. And so some of us will get to this place where it's like, oh, it's the end of the day and I forgot to do laundry and I forgot to be mindful. I totally screwed that up. And then we beat ourselves up because we want to be these calm parents and instead we yelled at our kids. So that moment when you notice that you're ramped up, that you're a million miles away, that you're yelling, whatever it is, that's what Sharon Salzberg, who's a very well um, regarded and one of the leading meditation teachers in this country, she calls it the magic moment. Any moment you notice and become aware I am losing it with my kid is the moment you can choose to make a different choice. And every once in a while, I have enough awareness that I will actually stop yelling at my kids mid-yell. And it's surprisingly effective because they're expecting this rant and then all of a sudden you just stop and they're like, whoa, what happened? And so whenever you can catch it, you can always stop. And we also have this thing with parenting that we have to be consistent, right? So once you've laid the law down, like you cannot change your mind ever, it's actually not true. Like, we make mistakes, we say the wrong thing, we set a limit that's not the right one or we don't set enough of a limit, you can go back and say, actually, I changed my mind, right? But that, it's, it's important that if, when it can, it comes from a mindful place as opposed to, I'm gonna set this limit, but now you're being a jerk about it and I don't really wanna fight with you and I'm tired and I just want you to go to bed so I can watch my TV show, so I'm gonna change my mind. Like, that's not really so effective, but when you can say, huh, now that I'm calm, I realize I didn't actually mean that, that's a better way. But check out the first book, Parenting in the Present Moment. It's got some good tips. And also, last tip, and then I see there's another question. Start practicing this when you're calm. Because just like we talked about with your kids, you can't teach them a new skill when they're freaking out. We can't teach ourselves a new skill when we're freaking out. So if we expect ourselves to be able to start a mindfulness practice when our kids are like really pushing our buttons, it's not going to happen. So either try meditation, which is a great one, or if you're like, I am not sitting on a cushion right now, that's not happening, lady. Then the other thing you can do is pick one or two activities you know you do every day and pay attention to them. And when your mind wanders, as it will after about two seconds, come back. So for me, it's taking a shower. I can get to the end of my shower, my hair is wet, I have no idea if I washed it, not a clue. And so can you pick two, one or two things you enjoy doing, don't make it harder than it has to be, drinking your coffee, reading to your kids, whatever it is, and just pay attention. So that's a, th th those are things that'll help. And the more you do that, the more your brain gets better at noticing, the more likely you will be to notice. Yeah, please. Um, <clears throat> this um, book looks great. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Thanks. One place that where we found that good ideas tend to break down is um, we have multiple kids. And I'm curious yeah. to know. Um, whether the book addresses it or, or not, I'm thinking of the, the calm down space. You know, in my house, that would turn into the, the Thunderdome, basically. <laughs> kid, you know, one kid, we could maybe do that, but then, especially if it, there's just one parent at home, yeah. you gotta go make dinner. Um, and usually, you know, we, we try good ideas and then it's either yelling or TV. You know, it's like yeah. those become our two options. So I'm just curious if you have, you know, when you're outnumbered, uh, yes. anything in the book or otherwise that. How many kids do you have? Uh, three so far. Yes, so you are well outnumbered. No, this is a huge problem. So the calm down space, you're right. This is a great, a big issue that comes up, but you can still do it with the calm down space even with multiple kids. And like in my daughter's classrooms, in every classroom at my daughter's school from K through eight, they have a calm down space. It's one space for like 24 kids. So they have to take turns and my daughter will come home frustrated sometimes that she didn't get her turn, that's fine. So having a space in the house is a good idea, but yes, when all three kids are melting down, um, that's when you have to put down the knife and like, which I'm making reference to my own experience, I'm not implying you carry knives around, although, um, and, and go be with them. And that's a moment. So one of the words that comes up a lot in mindfulness world is acceptance. I don't love that word because it's like, we have to accept and just be okay that our kids are gonna like cry forever. I like the word acknowledgement better. You have to just acknowledge in that moment that everyone is melting down and you have to make the best choice you can. And sometimes the best choice is TV. Like, 
practicing mindfulness does not mean we do the number one best parenting intervention at all times. And in fact, I would argue that's not helpful for your kids because then your kids learn that all of their needs will be met in the most effective way at every moment, which guess what, is not how the world works. So sometimes you yell, sometimes you turn on the TV. But when your kids are old enough that you can start to strategize, like can one of them go to their rooms if they need a break, and by choice, you know, can you use the calm down corner? Maybe a kid needs to plug in some headphones and listen to a guided meditation. Maybe, you know, I mean, it's, it really involves a lot of creativity, but you can do it with more than one kid. You just can't expect to do it perfectly all the time. And that's when the self-compassion and kindness and curiosity is really important because it's like, oh, well, I just lost it. And so can I be nice to myself and forgive myself? Because when you, most of us, when we do an unskillful parenting intervention, we tend to beat ourselves up about it. I'm a terrible parent. I can't believe I lost it. Everybody else is doing it better. Um, and then we get stuck and then our kids come in the room and we bite their heads off because we're in a bad headspace. So when you can be like, okay, well, that was a rough moment. Glad that's over. And, you know, thank God for TV because it's really useful sometimes. Then you're much more likely to do a better, um, have a better intervention next time. But it's tricky. Multiple kids is tricky. Um, you can also do little like group meditation things. Like I'll get my girls together and we do practices um, together. And again, this comes back to starting it when everybody's in a good space. Because the more you try to just start it when they're in a bad space, you're setting everyone up for failure. And then, um, you know, maybe boarding school? I don't know. That could help. And he, there was, was there somebody over here who had a question? I had a question about um, sibling like, arguing. It was the sibling arguing. Okay, so here's the thing about sibling arguing. I, I am not an expert in sibling arguing, and I did a lot of it when I was a kid. My girls do it now. Um, Laura Markham has a book, M-A-R-K-H-A-M, about sibling rivalry that I've heard good stuff about. Um, but I think that remembering that it's normal, like some amount of it is normal. This is, I mean, I saw some statistic that kids get into it with their siblings like once every seven seconds or something. Um, yikes. Uh, but that it's, it's an important part of their socialization. Like that's how they learn to figure things out. And what I would say, and this isn't necessarily a mindfulness bit, is depending on how old they are and if everybody's safe, can you just get out of the way and encourage them to figure it out? And one of my friends, what she'll do is she'll say, Either you guys figure it out or I take away the toy and you go to your room and you give them a choice. And, but again, different families have so much different stuff going on that the sibling stuff is really tricky. I find the other really good trick for sibling is to make sure everybody is fed and well slept, which is like a good life thing. Our worst sibling fights are in the afternoon when they're tired and they're worn out and then I just have to like work really hard to get them set up in some activity that involves relatively little interaction because <laughs> they can't handle it. Um, other questions, thoughts? Yeah, Jesse. So thinking about being mindful and, yes. and how I would do that in my life, I, I worry that, uh, that time pressure is the enemy of mind, mindfulness and that a lot of times the, the intense moments all have a time pressure aspect. Like I need to get this done by this time or get over to this place. And taking a step back and slowing down feels very hard. Yes, I agree. And I think we can all relate to you. And Certainly, you can move fast and be mindful. There's no question. Like, mindfulness does not require us to be slow, but it's just easier, right? And so what I would argue is that there are always going to be days and moments when you just feel like you're moving at 100 miles an hour. I think the trick is to convince yourself that you don't actually have to move at 100 miles an hour, and you will be more effective if you don't. And my best example is I'll get really stressed when we're trying to get out the door in the morning, and I'm, like, trying to make the lunches or whatever, although... In all fairness, Josh makes lunches most mornings. I have to give him that. But when I'm trying to like get everything together and what inevitably happens is I drop the blueberries all over the floor. Or I, like, I've got everyone in, in the car and I realize that I've forgotten something and we have to go back. And so when we can start to convince ourselves that when we can practice um, a little bit of mindfulness, it'll actually make things go faster and more smoothly. And when I say a little bit, I mean literally, can you stop and stand and take three deep breaths? And then ask yourself, what do I need to do now? Or if you're staring down the barrel of an insane day with a ton of meetings and all these projects, can you stop and take some deep breaths? And if you're a, if you're a person who likes to write things down, can you sort of make yourself a quick list and say, like, what are the things I need to focus on? Because when our brains get going, it's that forward thinking, we get so wrapped up in everything that has to happen in the future and all the worries about what if I don't get this done, that we end up just reacting like, oh, and now this thing popped in my brain, so I'm gonna do this. And then this thing popped in my brain, so I'm gonna do this. And that may not be the most skillful way to approach the day. It may be better to take a few, like, and it can literally be five minutes, which I would argue that since most of us aren't like the president of the United States, we actually have five minutes. We can sit down and say, like, what are the things I need to do today? What are the most effective? 
you know, ways to plan my day. And then when stuff pops up, we have this map in our mind of, okay, but this is what I was gonna do today, and is that thing that just popped up, is that worthy of intruding on this space and time? And it's the same thing with parenting. You know, If I can go into the afternoon with a plan, all right, I'm gonna give my girls a snack, and then we're gonna have some playtime, and then I'm gonna make dinner, and then something pops up, I can sort of make this choice. Is this the most skillful place to put my attention right now? And sometimes it is. Sometimes we just have to react, especially in parenting. Like when your kid's about to fall down the stairs, you gotta drop whatever you're doing, go grab them. But more often than not, I would argue we react when we don't need to. So I think small amounts of time on a busy day can make you feel, can make you actually be more effective during the day. This book is on Amazon and local bookstores, and then Parenting in the Present Moment is my first book, which is really meant more for parents who want to practice mindfulness, and I just really appreciate you all coming. Thank you.